Good Yantif, Chag Sameach. Sukkot is always a special time to be together. Last summer, our family vacation was to London, England. We took in the sights all around, the double-decker buses, Big Ben, of course, the theater, museums, Buckingham Palace, Israeli chef Yotam Otolenghi's restaurant, all the markets, high tea, and we took a walking tour of the Beatles' history and stopped at Abbey Road to take one of those very famous photos. The four of us, our family, walking across that famous intersection, reenacting John, Paul, George, and Ringo's iconic album cover. The Beatles' first track on Abbey Road is the song, Come Together, one of their legendary hits. One of the secrets of Sukkot, okay, not so secret, one of the main themes of this holiday is the need to come together and the mitzvah to come together at a time when our world, our country, perhaps even within our own lives and families, there is more division than ever, more gaps, more breaking away, with lines drawn in the sand, an us versus them, or a me versus a you, we have Sukkot, which tells us, come together. We have our lulav and etrog, which reminds us of the value and necessity to bind together to find that which unites us, that which binds us together. As the palm branches of the lulav are interwoven, connecting the myrtle and the willow, holding the etrog together as one. Rabbi Lord Jonathan Sachs of Blessed Memory shared this comment on Sukkot and the Beatles, who he knew. Perhaps he was a music historian, quote, our greatness as a people is when we come together. It's the we, not the I. The Beatles are a great secular example of this fundamental human truth. The fascinating thing about these four musicians is that as long as they stay together, they produce music of absolute genius. But when they split apart, they could never recapture it. It's the same individuals, the same four artists, but they lost the we. They were no longer bound together and able to achieve greatness. Our Torah teaches us in our Torah reading today from Leviticus, Vayikra, on the first days of Sukkot, you shall take the fruit of the Hadar tree, branches of palm, bows of leafy trees, and willows of the brook, and you shall rejoice before God for seven days. This describes the Arba Minim, the four species, the four different plants and fruits that make up the Lulav and the Etrog, each of them with their own special qualities, and when brought together, they combine to be something even more. And that's what we strive for as a community, as a people, and as a world. I've always been fascinated with the etrog, the cousin of the lemon that is more tart, more pulp, more seedy, more powerful. The fruit of the beautiful tree, eats pre hadar. Hadar means to dwell, because unlike other trees, the etrog tree produces fruit all year long. This week, Trader Joe's is selling lemons for 49 cents each, but the price of our etrog are significantly more than that, 30, 40, 50, 100, 1,000. They say that there are those who pay for their etrogs each year with diamonds because it's a mitzvah to get the most beautiful, the highest quality in order to sanctify the holiday. But I always find it jarring after spending the 10 days of repentance, Aseret Yom Tshuva, on Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, when we look inside of ourselves, these intense days of self-reflection and introspection, when we wear white to show that we are all equal and no one is better than us, when we find our own imperfections, when we judge our souls and we work to improve ourselves, to make better choices, when we finish this internal work of self-correcting, Within a day or two, we go and pick out an etrog, where there are intricate laws specifying what it must look like and where looks and appearances seem paramount. I actually have an entire book of photos that detail the correct kosher way that an etrog should look like. It should be symmetrical, 
Its left side should match its right side. The pitom shouldn't be angled this way or that way, but should be straight up. Because the rabbis teach tohu kivoro, that our insides should match our outsides. Perhaps since we have worked on beautifying our insides during the high holidays, the perfect etrog is an outer manifestation, a sign that our insides match our outsides, that we are complete, that we can begin the new year on the right foot. I'm sure you've heard the teaching that the four species are compared to our body. The lulav, the long palm branch, is our spine, that we should be stand tall and strong. We should follow our beliefs and stand up for those, those things we believe in and those that have no voice. The willow is our mouth, that we should speak words of Torah, truth, and compassion. The myrtle, our eyes, that we should have a good eye, be compassionate. And like the Cleveland Guardians hitter with a good eye, we should know when things are wrong and right, a ball or a strike, and when to bake, take that big swing to win the game. The etrog, of course, symbolizes our hearts, that our hearts should be a glow, not just filled with light, but also shine upon others, sharing our love and kindness for all. The famous Israeli poet Shai Agnon told this story. When he met his neighbor, a rabbi in a neighborhood, he saw the neighbor as he had just bought his etrog. There, Shai Agnon noticed how meticulous his neighbor was when he chose that etrog. Even though his neighbor was a man of very limited means, the rabbi insisted on purchasing the finest and most expensive etrog that the shop had. He examined the entire inventory. Finally, his neighbor, the rabbi, chose the one that he wished for and he paid for it with practically everything in his wallet. Walking home with Shai Agnon, his neighbor, the rabbi, emphasized to him how important it is to have a beautiful, flawless etrog on Sukkot, how the beauty of the etrog was part of the fulfillment of the divine commandment for the holiday. And then, on Sukkot morning, at services, Shai Agnon noticed that his neighbor, the rabbi, didn't have an etrog. What happened? Shai Agnon was perplexed. He asked the rabbi, where is this most extravagant, most beautiful, most perfect etrog that he had bought? And the rabbi answered by telling him this story. You see, I woke up early on the holiday, as is my practice, and I prepared to take the lulav and etrog to say the bracha first thing in the morning. You know, the rabbis say that you should rush to do a mitzvah. So I was standing on my merpeset, my balcony in Israel. As you know, we have a neighbor on the other side of our balcony. They have a large family, and our balconies adjoin. As you might remember, our neighbor, the father of all those children next door, is a man with a very short temper. Many times he shouts at his children for violating his rules and his wishes. I've talked to him many times about his harshness, but to no avail. As I stood in the sukkah this morning, about to recite the blessing over the etrog to bench lulav, I heard one of my neighbor's kids crying. It was a little girl. She was weeping the loudest way that you could hear. She was groaning and moaning, one of the children of our neighborhood. So I walked over and leaned over to the other side of the balcony and I asked her what was wrong. She told me that she also woke up first thing in the morning. All she wanted to do was take in her hands her father's etrog to feel it and to smell it, to feel it, see its delightful appearance. Of course, her father did not allow her to look at it, much less touch the etrog, but she went against her father's instructions, woke up early while he was still sleeping. She took the etrog out from its protective box and examined it. Unfortunately, she dropped the etrog on the floor and the pitom, the tip, was broken off. She damaged it, and if you know the halacha, you know the laws. Once the pitom is broken off, it's not kosher anymore. You can't use it on Sukkot. She knew that her father would be enraged and punish her severely, hence the frightened tears and the apprehension. And this is what Shai Agnon's neighbor, the rabbi, said. I comforted her, 
And then I took my etrog, I placed it in her father's box, taking that damaged, not kosher anymore etrog to my house. And I told her to tell her father this. His neighbor insisted that he accept the gift of this most beautiful etrog so that he would honor me and the holiday by doing so. In Chayagnon's words, quote, my neighbor's damaged, bruised, ritually unusable etrog was the most beautiful etrog that I've ever seen in my lifetime. The etrog that we each hold in our hands, and we will again when we do Hoshanot in a few moments, symbolizes our heart and our soul. May we hold it as gently to our heart as our heart cares for all those that we love and hold so dear. May the etrog be as sweet, and may we be as sweet as the etrog sent. May we learn that true celebration means acknowledging the gifts and goodness in our lives and that which we can shower upon others. May we remember that the wrinkles of the etrog skin give it its own character, as do ours. May we remember that when life gives us lemons, make lemonade. When life gives us etrogs, make Etrog jam and vodka. And in the words of Rabbi Sachs and the Beatles, may we all come together. May we celebrate the we and the I. Celebrate our unity. Celebrate what, that which connects us. How the best of us makes the best for all. Knowing that when we are together, when we are bound together, we are stronger. Chag <laughs> Sameach.